Welcome to the Ambassadorial Series. I'm Jill Doherty. Probably no Americans have as unique and in-depth perspectives on Russia as United States ambassadors. They arrive at their posts in Moscow often with deep knowledge of the country and its language. They live in Russia. They meet and negotiate with the highest Russian officials. They travel throughout the country, interact with Russian citizens. They not only are eyewitnesses to Russia's history, but actors in that history. In the ambassadorial series, we hear from all the living U.S. ambassadors to modern Russia and to the Soviet Union before it. They recount their personal experiences in Moscow, the people they met, the challenges and even dangers they sometimes faced. And with the benefit of time to ponder these experiences, they tell us how they understand Russia, its relationship with the United States, and the impact that relationship has on the world. We really saw opportunities in the, in the horrible tragedy. We saw opportunities to cement the kind of strategic partnership with Russia that we had been trying to build uh, during the 1990s with, uh, with Yeltsin. And of course we had, I think, tremendous public support for doing just that. Uh, I remember, I'll never forget, the, uh, the outpouring of sympathy and solidarity by the, the people of Moscow from the whole country came converging on the, uh, the old embassy building on Ulitsa Tchaikovskova uh, with flowers, with candles, children leaving their precious teddy bears, all out of sympathy for, for our loss of so many Americans and other nationalities in the 9-11 attacks. Alexander Vershbow dealt with some of the weightiest and thorniest issues between the United States and Russia, especially the expansion of NATO. In the 1990s, he worked at the National Security Council on the team that developed the two-track roadmap for NATO enlargement, which included developing a strategic partnership between NATO and Russia. He served as U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 1997 to 2001. Then, in July 2001, he took up his duties as Ambassador to Moscow, less than two months before the attacks of 9-11. Ambassador Alexander Vershbow, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, just looking at your history, uh, 1997 to 2001, you were the ambassador to NATO, and then 2001 to 2005, ambassador to Russia. And I was very lucky to have worked at that very same time in Moscow. I always appreciated your openness, and I learned a lot from what you said in our conversation. So it's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much for being here. It's my pleasure. I welcome this opportunity. So, you know, that period, of course, was early Vladimir Putin. He comes in in 2000, in the year 2000. He had been around as prime minister previously, but all of a sudden now he is president. And I was thinking back to that period, it was very promising. He was doing some economic reform. He looked like a uh, man who had it together after a pretty chaotic period with Boris Yeltsin. Um, you yourself, I think, talked about an alliance with Russia. There was hope that there might be some type of alliance. But then by the time your tour was over, relations had really changed. I mean, mm -hmm. we did have uh, elections, obviously, uh, difficulty with the United States view of those elections. We had the attack in Beslan and the way the Russian government handled that. Uh, we had the war in Chechnya. There were many different factors. But, it, you know, looking back at that, why did it change? Mm -hmm. And how much? Well, it was indeed an interesting time, and it did start uh, on a relatively hopeful note. Uh, I arrived in Moscow in the summer of 2001 after having been at, at NATO and having launched the NATO-Russia cooperative relationship, which already had its ups and downs, including uh, differences over Kosovo. But still, arriving in Moscow, even before the events of 9-11, which were early in my tenure, we still had hopes that we were going to pick up where we left off and even maybe do even better because Putin was a much more stable character. He uh, did seem to get it when it came to economic reform. He introduced a flat tax and generally began the process of 
nurturing a, a middle class in Russia. Uh, but he, and he certainly did seem to be very pragmatic. I mean, clearly, his, his background as a KGB officer was uh, grounds for some, some wariness. Uh, it was clear that he was a bit more nostalgic for the Soviet past than Yeltsin. He changed the national anthem back to the Soviet anthem uh, soon after uh, he uh, became the acting uh, president when Yeltsin resigned. So uh, you know, we had our hopes of some, some, some continuing questions. Uh, but then 9-11 happened, and uh, we really saw opportunities in the, in the horrible tragedy. We saw opportunities to cement the kind of strategic partnership with Russia that we had been trying to build uh, during the 1990s with, uh, with Yeltsin. And of course, we had, I think, tremendous public support for doing just that. Uh, I remember, I'll never forget, the, uh, the outpouring of sympathy and solidarity by the, the people of Moscow from the whole country came converging on the, uh, the old embassy building on Ulitsa Tchaikovskova uh, with flowers, with candles, children leaving their precious teddy bears, all out of sympathy for, for our loss of so many Americans and other nationalities in the 9-11 attacks. And of course, Putin was quick to seize on this, the first foreign leader to uh, try to reach President Bush by phone, offering to help us and retaliating against uh, what we're seeing as uh, the perpetrators, Al-Qaeda. And I think at, at the popular level, I felt right from the beginning of my time there, uh, a feeling that the Russian people wanted a closer partnership with the West. They wanted to continue on the, the path of reform that uh, had been started by Gorbachev and Yeltsin. And uh, that you know, part of my mission was to talk up the idea of a closer partnership, even an alliance with the small a, we weren't ready to make it a treaty, but an alliance with the United States, an alliance with NATO uh, as the basis for the kind of strategic partnership that could make the, the, the changes at the end of the Cold War truly irreversible. So I gave lots of speeches. I was thought out everywhere I went by the media, invited all over the country to give speeches, and I was always accentuating the common interests and even the common values that uh, could form the basis for the uh, strategic partnership. But it was not too long after I started my, my tour of duty in, the, in, the, in, uh, 20, uh, in 2001 that uh, President Putin made clear that moving westward was not necessarily the direction he wanted to take Russia. I mean, right when I arrived in the summer of 2001, Russia was always in, already in the throes of a battle over the independent TV media. And Putin was clearly moving to, uh, to control and effectively muzzle the more independent TV stations, including NTV. I gave lots of speeches on the importance of independent media, uh, which I think caught the Kremlin's eye that I was uh, maybe a bit more uh, of a campaigner for, for our values than, uh, than previous ambassadors. But the, the, the attacks on the media were just the first of a series of steps by Putin to begin to roll back a lot of the changes that uh, had taken place in the 90s uh, to uh, begin to uh, put some pressure on the assistance and democratization programs that the uh, U.S. government was running through our uh, embassy. And it wasn't too long uh, before I started to warn of a growing values gap between uh, the United States and Russia, between the West and Russia, and that this could undermine the basis for the strategic partnership that both of our countries really needed and, and I thought both of our peoples really wanted. So, uh, uh, started, started, started good. Bush and Putin, I think, had a reasonably good relationship when they first had their initial meetings. At the end of 2001, there was even this uh, very warm and friendly meeting at at Bush's ranch in Crawford, Texas, as well as an equally warm meeting uh, on the margins of the uh, APEC summit in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, but it was becoming clearer that uh, Putin was much more in a transactional mode. The idea of shared interests, shared values, he took as uh, largely rhetoric. And uh, he was looking for quid pro quos rather than uh, thinking, uh, thinking in a more lofty fashion about a strategic partnership with the United States and the West.
You know, it's hard, I think, to put your finger on exactly when things changed. And as you pointed out, there were a lot of different factors. But when you mentioned 2001 and 9-11, um, I was there at the, a time, and I remember exactly what you're talking about. Russians coming up to the embassy, leaving little gifts, and there was real grief and, I think, solidarity with the United States. But then, and this is before you came to Moscow, you were, at that point, um, the ambassador to NATO, but the uh, uh, NATO's bombing of Belgrade happened in, what was that, 99. And I remember the front of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in a very different situation. People were protesting. There was a lot of anger. And I even remember that period where there were a lot of Russian friends who up to that point had been, I'd say, you know, maybe not pro-Western, but they were certainly open to the West and cooperation. And a curtain went down. It changed almost overnight. So I guess, um, do you, what do you remember from your perspective at that time of the bombing of Belgrade and the Kosovo War, as you, as you mentioned? And um, was it, do you think that, do you understand why Russia reacted so vehemently to what happened? I do remember that very well. I was in, in Brussels, but uh, working with the Russians was uh, part of my portfolio and how the U.S. and, and the other partners trying to work this Kosovo crisis. If there was, remember, the contact group with uh, UK, France, Germany, Italy, and, and the United States, and Russia, uh, trying to lead diplomatic efforts to solve the problem of the ethnic cleansing and the and the mushrooming uh, humanitarian crisis you know, with hundreds of thousands of refugees flooding into Macedonia and other, uh, other countries. Uh, so, so I def definitely was engaged on the Russian front and we saw lots of visits by Madeleine Albright and Strobe Talbot to NATO. Uh, and, and looking back, it clearly was an important uh, milestone in the, the, the downward evolution of the relationship, uh, which kind of reached its nadir with uh, Putin's speech in 2007 to the Munich Security Conference, where he basically made clear he was writing off cooperation with the, rest, with the West and uh, moving to a much more confrontational stance. And we had the invasion of Georgia the year after. Uh, and then the Orange Revolution, the, the, uh, the Maidan in Ukraine and the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, annexation of Crimea. But at the time, I think we thought we'd kind of manage the Kosovo issue, maybe more than is, uh, is seen with the benefit of hindsight now. The, R the Russians clearly uh, wanted to be part of the team as the crisis began to unfold in 1998. Uh, as part of the contact group, they were, were pretty much in full agreement with the diplomatic strategy, which was to put the pressure on Milosevic to end the ethnic cleansing agree to a political solution, grant autonomy to Kosovo, and, and here was the less agreed point, agree to an international peacekeeping force on the ground in Kosovo to, to enforce the deal. Uh, so the diplomacy went on for many months. It culminated in a final showdown at uh, the French city of Rambouillet. And at that event, uh, the Russians made clear they were not going to insist that Milosevic accept a peacekeeping force. And uh, we, we, to our regret, parted ways. The uh, U.S. and the uh, NATO allies went through with the threat to use force to, to compel Milosevic to accept the peacekeeping force. And uh, Russia and we agreed to disagree. Uh, now, what was irritating for the Russians was the fact that NATO decided that it had no choice, given the humanitarian disaster that was taking place, to act even without the ex explicit authorization of the United Nations Security Council, which of course meant working around, circumventing Russia's veto in the Security Council. And uh, they were clearly upset. Foreign Minister Primakov uh, f famously turned his plane around when he heard that the bombing had begun. Uh, and uh, uh, there was the, 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 the protests outside the embassy in Moscow, as you, as you said. 
but as I said, I think we thought we had it handled pretty well within within a few weeks. We we assured the Russians that this was, this was kind of an exception. We we didn't uh, disrespect their their status as a Security Council member with a veto. Uh, we you know this was extreme circumstances when uh, hundreds of thousands of people could could have died. And we pointed out to the Russians that they had voted on uh, like five or six other resol resolutions, which did accept that this was a, a threat to international peace and security, which is the, the UN buzzword for justifying the use of force. So we said, you, know, you agreed in, in, in implicitly that force was allowed, so uh, let's, let's look forward and try to, try to find a solution together. And they, they did. Yeltsin, I think, still trusted Bill Clinton. Uh, and agreed that Russia would actually help in trying to persuade Milosevic to give in uh, with the help of Prime Minister Chernomyrdin and f Finnish President Atasari. We were able to bring the air campaign to a successful end uh, in less than three months. And uh, Russians helped with the diplomacy. They also then agreed to put their own troops under NATO command on the ground in Kosovo. So it was a rough patch, but uh, we thought uh, we'd limited the damage and kind of were able to keep cooperation with Russia on track. What I think happened in subsequent years, however, maybe magnified the negative view of these events in, in Russia, and certainly among the security elite that formed Putin's power base. And uh, because when, when we... Uh, attacked Iraq in 2003. We did it again without a UN Security Council authorization. Uh, and so it wasn't a one-off, as we had assured the Russian leadership. It was, uh, in fact, uh, becoming a habit <laughs> to circumvent the Russians' Security Council veto. And so, the, so that, plus other issues that began to undermine trust, such as missile defense, uh, and of course, uh, for me, the, the biggest watershed event was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which is at the end of 2004, when I think Putin began to feel that all the West's talk of partnership was uh, a smokescreen for a cynical plot to undermine Russia, to deprive it of its rightful domination over its neighbors, and even to bring about color revolutions all over the former Soviet space, including in Russia itself, and ultimately topple the Putin regime. So Kosovo became part of this very hostile narrative, uh, sort of the, the, the narrative of Western betrayal of Russia, and d does now loom much larger in, uh, in Russian rhetoric right up to the present day. Uh, I, I don't recall hearing all that much about it when I was ambassador. You know, which was just two years after the, the bombing of Belgrade. So I think there's the passage of time has made them hate what we did even more than they did at the time. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think we can not talk about NATO expansion. I mean, that is something that has uh, bedeviled the relationship almost since it happened. If anything, it's worse right now. Russia is furious, has been, and still is. And there's division even in the United States among experts and Russia watchers and others uh, as to whether it was a good idea. And you're the perfect person to ask about mm -hmm. this because you were the ambassador to NATO. So where do you come down on this? I mean, yeah. really, and I know it's, it's always a balancing act, but right. what do you say? Well, I'm a great uh, believer that NATO enlargement was the right thing to do, particularly in the context of the events immediately following the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I was very much involved in it uh, before I went to as ambassador to NATO when I was working at the National Security Council uh, in the mid-90s during the Clinton administration. And I was part of the what was called the Troika with uh, Daniel Fried, uh, Nick Burns, who later was succeeded by Steve Pfeiffer, a lot of familiar names who basically kind of, at, at the direction of, of President Clinton and uh, Tony Lake, the National Security Advisor, kind of developed a roadmap for NATO enlargement, which was a two-track strategy. It was about enlarging NATO to kind of rectify, rectify the wrongs of Yalta, 
and uh, bring the emerging democracies of Central and Eastern Europe into the Western family, into the institutions of the liberal order, uh, Europe whole and free, all these wonderful slogans that had real historical meaning. But it was a two-track strategy which involved, together with NATO enlargement, a strategic partnership between NATO and Russia. And uh, the policy was worked out with, with our NATO allies and pursued quite deliberately uh, to ensure that there was a place for Russia that uh, would recognize its strategic importance. That was the, the NATO-Russia Founding Act signed in 1997, the creation of a, of a permanent council now called the NATO-Russia Council. And it was actually Putin who uh, pushed for upgrading the NATO-Russia partnership during my time as ambassador uh, when there was a, a NATO-Russia summit meeting in, uh, in Rome, which issued a kind of sequel to the NATO-Russia Founding Act and uh, agreed that this permanent council would become not a bilateral NATO against Russia, but a council of 20 sovereign states, in equal states, uh, trying to work together to address European security together. So uh, I think to the, the, the beginning of NATO enlargement, including the first round in the late 90s with Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, and the second round when the three Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, came in, was handled very well. And while the Russians didn't like NATO, they didn't like NATO enlargement, I think they recognized we, we had gone the extra mile, even including assurances that we were, we're not going to put nuclear weapons in the territory of new members, that we we're going to limit the size of conventional deployments and rely more on uh, reinforcement and interoperability. Uh, so I think we worked it out well. Where I think we made mistakes was later on. And here I think the Bush administration pushed the issue of, uh, not of actual membership, but of just putting Ukraine and Georgia into the kind of the on-deck circle for, for membership in a thing called the Membership Action Plan. Uh, by pushing for that in 2008, just a few years after the Orange Revolution and the Rose Revolution in Georgia, and failing to get the rest of the allies to support what we were trying to do, uh, just arriving at the summit saying, we want this, and finding that the allies were just as opposed as Putin, who was in attendance at this summit meeting in Bucharest. I think that kind of uh, was very counterproductive and it may have fueled Russian skepticism of not just of NATO, but of partnership with the West. But, uh, but I still think that uh, if you're looking for the causes of the breakdown in relations, uh, which are indeed at their lowest point since the height of the Cold War, no, no doubt about that, uh, I, I point to other other factors, including Kosovo, including Iraq, including our abrogation of the uh, ABM Treaty and uh, pursuit of missile defense, uh, which we were able to show technically was not really directed against Russia, but we didn't do a very good job of, of uh, handling the Russians, and it's still an irritant to this day. I think NATO enlargement, particularly the early part of it, has uh, become a central part of this revisionist narrative, but as I said, I think we, we handled it pretty well, and it was in any case strategically the right thing to do for countries that uh, we had abandoned in 1945. It was important to bring them into the, uh, into the Western family, uh, but to do it in a way that didn't alienate Russia, and I think for a time we succeeded in that regard. You know, there is this theory, um, I think it's basically a Russian idea, which is at the end of the Cold War, instead of expanding NATO or anything like that, that there should have been a complete rethinking of the relationship between Russia and the West, and that there should have been some sort of a an overarching security structure brought in, that there was no need for NATO anymore because Russia was no longer a threat. You know, of course, this mm -hmm. idea very well. What do you think of that? Well, you know, I was involved in the decision, and I think still it was the right one, that we had an organization that was very effective, which had shown in earlier 
periods that it was able to uh, evolve and adapt to, to changing circumstances. And that given the fragility of the situation uh, at the end of the Cold War and the potential for further Yugoslavias, where the, you know, the opening up could become violent, uh, including the breakup of the Soviet Union itself, it was better to build on and adapt the institutions we had uh, in a way that would be inclusive, would bring Russia into a common security uh, architecture, as we like to say. And, uh, and of course, it wasn't only about NATO. There were efforts in, in those days, in the early 90s, to uh, adapt the uh, Helsinki process, the CSCE, which was renamed the OSCE, to, to give it more of an operational character. And this was the one organization where Russia and all countries in Europe, all the way out to Central Asia, uh, were, were full members. And uh, there was an effort to, uh, to, to kind of energize the OSCE. Uh, got off to a rocky start at the Budapest summit in 94 uh, when Yeltsin gave the infamous cold peace speech. But I think over the years we did uh, equip the OSCE to be much more effective in uh, overseeing elections and doing post-conflict uh, diplomacy and uh, I implementation of uh, peace agreements, and of course defending human rights and promoting uh, open economies, uh, since the uh, Helsinki Accords had three baskets. Uh, and so that, that became a useful adjunct, but I think the, 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 the reformed and adapted NATO was essential, and we did everything to kind of turn the original mantra of NATO inside out. Uh, Remember, people used to say that NATO was about keeping the Americans in, keeping the Russians out, and keeping the Germans down. Well, it suddenly became an instrument for bringing the Russians in and uh, building a, a lasting security partnership. I still think that's a goal we should be, we should pursue, even though relations are so bad now. It's it's sort of just a a, a vision uh, beyond the horizon. But things could change, uh, and uh, I think ultimately uh, trying again, maybe doing a little bit better with this NATO-Russia partnership could be part of a uh, of restoration of normal relations, uh, even now with Putin still in power or when he departs the scene. You mentioned human rights, and I know the Bush administration criticized the Clinton administration for too much attention to that issue. But you know, how do you square that? How do you balance the respect for human rights, protection of human rights, and raw US national security interests? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult issue. And I've been involved in different times in kind of trying to find the right balance. Because so I started my career in the late 70s. I worked on the Soviet desk was involved in uh, in the uh, defense of the right of, of Soviet Jews to emigrate. Uh, as things began to open up under Gorbachev, I was part of the Human Rights Working Group with uh, former Assistant Secretary of State Richard Shifter, trying to uh, build a more cooperative approach to human rights. But it's always been difficult. Uh, the Bush administration, when I was ambassador, did. Uh, deliberately tread f fairly lightly on human rights, uh, more so than the Clinton administration. The, the Bush freedom agenda was several years into the future. Uh, I think the judgment was that uh, with Russia also a victim of terrorism, uh, homegrown terrorism in particular, although there were links to international terrorist networks, uh, to the Chechen terrorists. Uh, that we should uh, highlight the sort of the solidarity and the sh and the shared threats and challenges, and not harp too much on the brutality with, that they were applying in uh, trying to end the Chechen conflict. Uh, but of course, it was not just what we said, uh, but what we were doing. And I think the Bush administration continued a lot of the programs, all the programs, until the Russians turned them off, uh, that had been launched in the 1990s, uh, some by the Bush 41 administration, but mainly under uh, under Clinton, to promote uh, 
democratization, rule of law, judicial reform, uh, to help fledgling NGOs kind of learn how to organize and fundraise and you know promote their uh, their agenda, whether it was environmental protection or labor rights or women's rights. Uh, and I think it was a very uh, receptive audience when we started for those programs, even during the Putin years. Uh, and that's, I think, one, one reason why I felt it was my, my duty to continue to talk about democracy and human rights in my public uh, statements and interviews. Uh, because we had uh, courageous Russians fighting for the, the, the Western values that we held dear. Uh, I think it was, it was the programs that ultimately began to get uh, under the skin uh, of, Mo of Mr. Putin and Mr. Uh, Patrushev, who was head of the uh, FSB in those days. I think they began to view these assistance programs as uh, an effort to undermine the Putin system, to promote opposition uh, to Putin's uh, leadership. And so we saw sort of one by one these programs uh, shut down in some cases, or the Peace Corps was told to leave Russia. Uh, it was a very sad moment because they were very popular, mainly teaching English or small business development in the hinterland. But uh, the Russians said they weren't wanted anymore, not by the locals, but by Putin. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's now clear that in, in today's relationship with this hostile view of the West as trying to undermine Russia, uh, we have very little ability to uh, influence events. We, we don't have these tools that we had in the 90s and uh, the early part of this century. Uh, and we have to uh, uh, be, be realistic about how much we can accomplish. I think we, you know, we have to be careful not to apply a strict linkage between negotiations on arms control or, or trade and human rights, because we may end up tying our own hands much more tightly than uh, is in our own interest. Uh, but to the extent that we can still reach out through uh, media, through social media, through uh, what academic exchanges still do continue, uh, sort of at a, at a, at a local, low level, uh, even without the big US funded programs uh, running any longer we can hopefully get through to this, the younger generation, try to c convince them that the West isn't Russia's enemy, that we're not trying to weaken Russia or deprive, of it, deprive Russia of its uh, status in the world, and that we have a lot more in common than divides us, uh, you know, whether it's dealing with pandemics or climate change, there's plenty of things that Russians and Americans should be doing together, and maybe uh, younger generation, which uh, may be showing a little bit of signs of re restiveness. If you look at the protests in Khabarovsk or the support for Navalny, there, there may be a market for closer exchanges uh, a few years uh, down the road. So we should you know, try to keep the door open, but be realistic about how much we can influence internal change in Russia. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Putin a little bit, because I, I think there are so many people, at least in the United States, who have this image of President Putin as running everything. <laughs> he was the man in charge. And sometimes I think he wants to give that impression. But you've seen him, you've met him, you've observed him. You know, you were there at the beginning of his presidency. Um, how would you explain the power dynamic in Russia? How much does Putin actually control? If he doesn't control everything, who does? And he mentioned early on in our discussion his KGB background, security services, et cetera. Would, can you explain some of this dynamic? Sure, I will, I'll give my, my version. There's a lot of uh, theories. It's, it's uh, not a totally transparent system. Uh, but first, my impressions of Putin, the man uh, in those early years was when I would see him mainly during uh, high-level visits. Uh, ambassadors uh, historically don't have real direct relations with, with the president or with the general secretary in earlier eras. Uh, so I mainly saw him during uh, high-level visits. But, I, but I, 
so I'm in public engagements and talk to people who did see him in d different contexts. And I think he was impressive right f from the early days uh, with just how uh, smart and self-confident he was in talking about the issues. He could kind of dominate the conversation, uh, put his interlocutor on the defensive. Uh, he flaunted his knowledge superior knowledge of the issues and uh, but it also I think was clear that he relied too heavily on his intelligence services for information a lot of which was uh, fairly slanted but it was clear that he believed that Russia could only be could be ruled could only be kept stable with a strong st centralized state with a strong hand uh, that uh, democracy wasn't suitable for a multi-ethnic, sprawling country like Russia. Uh, and he certainly viewed the West, I think, in, in, in a kind of zero-sum terms. Uh, there was a pragmatic streak to him, uh, he wasn't, and he wasn't reckless. He, he knew his strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but, uh, but as I was saying before, he did, I think, become convinced, certainly by the time I left Russia in 2005, that the West was trying to weaken and marginalize Russia, and that Russia had the right to sort of strike back with any means available. Uh, so uh, now the system that he's put together is sometimes called a kleptocracy, because I think ha having purged a lot of the uh, oligarchs, the, the big business tycoons who exploited the chaos and the uh, the sell-off of the clapped-out uh, Soviet economy in the 90s, ha having purged most of them or, or tamed them uh, by setting the, the example of uh, incarcerating Mikhail Khodorkovsky, uh, he's basically assembled a new inner circle of, of new oligarchs who are all veterans of the uh, intelligence services and old, old uh, colleagues of Putin who really form a kind of a, a directorate. But, but Putin is clearly the decider. He's the first among equals. He plays sometimes rival uh, power, power lords uh, off against one another. Uh, he uh, definitely doesn't trust his own people. He doesn't want to have any real elections or real opposition. Uh, he believes, you know, father knows best uh, that the, the, the strong leader and, and the strong state basically decide what's in the interest of the people. Uh, will do enough to uh, keep keep them economically uh, content, and uh, uh, anybody who challenges the system will be uh, dealt with quite severely, even with extreme prejudice as. Uh, was the case with Boris Nemtsov. Uh, so it's not quite a s single personalist dictatorship, but he's definitely the first among equals and, and uh, calls the shot and uses the uh, wealth of the nation, which is divvied up among these different uh, uh, cronies and uh, clans beneath the, each of these cronies as a way of uh, kind of keeping everybody in check, playing them off against one another. Uh, and uh, you know, holding the sword of Damocles over them, that if they if they misbehave, he'll uh, do to them what what he's done to uh, Khodorkovsky and, and other enemies. Yeah. I saw a quote from President Putin recently where he said he believes essentially <clears throat> that the relationship will be bad for the foreseeable future, and as we know, he can be president legally until 2036. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel... At least. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, that's true. But uh, when you talk with people in Moscow, many people say they have concluded that it's going to be sanctions followed by more sanctions, followed by more sanctions without any particular policy, but they're in it for the long run. And Putin, obviously, it appears, uh, has concluded that he can get through that period. Um, so what is he thinking? D does he have a strategy, a long-term uh, strategy? 
Uh, I'm not sure he has a, a strategy for getting out of this impasse. First of all, I think he's convinced himself and a lot of the Russian elite have convinced themselves that uh, the West is to blame. They kind of don't do a very good job in looking themselves in the mirror when sort of looking at, at seminal events like the uh, invasion of Georgia or more, even more so the uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, you know, flagrantly breaking all the rules, changing borders by force, and then lying about it, pretending that uh, you know, they don't have troops in eastern Ukraine when there's thousands there and the commanders are all Russian officers with their insignias peeled off. So they, uh, they believe their own propaganda. But I think it goes deeper than that because I think given Putin's view that the West is really out to get him, the West is out to deny Russia its, its seat at the top table, that we're using democracy and color revolutions to uh, undermine regimes in, in the former Soviet Union and in Russia itself, that uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we reject Russia's rightful claim to a sphere of influence in which it can uh, dictate to its neighbors, that uh, therefore the, you know, the, the West is to blame and the current deadlock is not going to be easily broken. Uh, I think he actually uses this narrative, uh, the, the Russians call it the besieged fortress narrative, as uh, also a tool for maintaining his tight political control, for uh, justifying the stagnant economy by blaming the West for that. Uh, and, uh, of course, blaming the West for everything bad that's happened to Russia for the last 30 years, or even, even going back even farther with this whole revisionist history about World War II. Uh, so uh, so f I think f for reasons more on the Russian side than on our side, uh, the current deadlock looks like it will go on for some time, and it might even be convenient to, to Putin. But I think that there may be pressures from within, even in the next couple of years, to, uh, to at least de-escalate a little bit. Uh, as I said, the economy is stagnant. The sanctions haven't crippled Russia, but they've, they've definitely hurt. There's very little foreign investment. It's, you know, it's all been compounded by the low oil price, but still uh, the Russian economy is in the doldrums and sta standards of living are, are, are definitely falling. Uh, also, his efforts to dominate his neighbors aren't going quite as well these days as they may have seemed to be going. Uh, Ukraine is still uh, in, a, in a kind of stalemate in terms of the military conflict in eastern Ukraine. But Ukraine continues to more and more orient itself towards the West. And I think psychologically, Russia has lost Ukraine, it's lost the Ukrainian people uh, by its uh, brutal treatment uh, and, and propaganda and disinformation on top of that. Uh, Belarus is now an unexpected headache. Russia doesn't want to legitimize another people's revolution, but it doesn't know quite how to steer th events in a way that would keep Belarus uh, you know, under control or at least manageable. And now in uh, the Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, Turkey has staked out a strong strategic position. And while Russia got what it wanted in the short term with troops on the ground uh, to separate the parties, it's perceived as having basically abandoned Armenia and let the Turks establish a strategic foothold in, in the former Soviet space, which uh, is going to encourage other of Russia's neighbors to begin to look elsewhere for support than, than to Moscow. So a lot of reasons why uh, he, he may be looking for a way to de-escalate. He knows Biden isn't going to give him a free pass the way Trump did on you know, interfering in our democracy. Uh, Biden will re reunite NATO and probably forge a, a tougher policy on Russia, I think, if, uh, if I read his statements correctly. So Putin may, uh, may, may be looking for a way, a way out, and this could give a little bit more uh, uh, cover for the forces that are still there within Russia, kind of keeping their heads down, to start advocating a more constructive relationship with the West. So uh, it may not happen until 2036, as you said, Putin could be president and he could be stubborn and not want to take any chances. Uh, but I think somehow something's got to give
a little sooner than that. And we should be ready for that. Uh, we should be showing Russia that sanctions will be lifted if the conditions that we set uh, are met. In the case of Ukraine, it's getting out of the, the Donbass and reintegrating that uh, region uh, into Ukraine. And, you know, agreeing to disagree for some years on Crimea. We're not going to solve everything at once, but I, I always say Donbass is the litmus test. Uh, but if he does that, we should be very quick with our European allies to lift the sanctions and show that uh, virtue is rewarded. Uh, and over time, maybe we could start a virtuous cycle that would get us back to uh, the good old days of the, uh, of the 1990s and the, uh, the NATO-Russia partnership. You know, I wanted to ask you um, about diplomacy in general, because your portfolio has been very heavy. I mean, this is <laughs> these are the biggest issues, you know, NATO, security, et cetera. And yet I have an image of you uh, at Spasso House, the, Rush, the amb ambassador's residence in Moscow. And I think you were playing the drums, as I remember, mm -hmm. at, at an event. And there were always the outreach to Russians always had to do deal with culture. And so I'm just wondering, in your time in Moscow, um, how do you see the role of an ambassador, you know, balancing those very heavy and serious issues with the outreach to the people, the cultural understanding, which is so big and major between Russia and the United States? How did you personally balance that? Well, that kind of outreach is what makes the job uh, a lot of fun. And I think it also makes uh, an ambassador more effective. It makes an embassy as a whole, because it's not just uh, one person. It's the whole team uh, that can create a, a, a more positive impression of America, of America's role in the world, and just kind of find so many ways where our two peoples have points of contact that we might not, e might not even have been aware of. So I really enjoyed, first of all, traveling around the country, uh, seeing the, just the diversity of, of Russian culture and, and, and the splendors of Siberia and all these sorts of things. But, uh, but meeting with the people, uh, particularly with students, people who had traveled abroad, had been perhaps on one of our exchange programs and loved to explain how it changed their perspective. Some people said it changed their life. You know, they, they decided to start a small business when they saw how mom and pop stores are the kind of engine of uh, development in, 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 in small town America. Uh, but also the, uh, the cultural opportunities were marvelous and having a resource like Spasso House, the ambassador's residence, was t too great to pass up. So we had monthly uh, concerts with mostly with Russian musicians. Sometimes traveling American jazz artists would would play there. Uh, even got my mother-in-law involved. She had a musical troupe in Boston that did uh, uh, cabaret and show tunes, and they came over, and they, they were a big hit. Uh, but mostly it was Russian musicians, uh, both jazz and classical, uh, which created a an opportunity to bring people from all different parts of Russian society together with all the different uh, agencies represented in our embassy and the, and the wider American expat community uh, to, uh, to get to know each other, to, to enjoy the same music and then discover that uh, somebody working at the Ministry of Justice and you know, somebody from the American Chamber of Commerce uh, had a shared love of opera and you know, they became good friends. Uh, and this was a time when anything was really possible in this domain. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I got invitations all over the country. I gave long speeches to universities. I visited uh, small business ventures. I visited the secret nuclear sites that we were helping to clean up and prevent loose nukes. We took uh, American artists and musicians on the road for, for tours in the Urals, lots of things. And of course, you know, the whole embassy was very much involved in this. And of course, for me as a wannabe drummer, to even play with the great Igor Butman big, big band uh, at his club or at Spasso House was, was sort of gravy. And I think it gives, puts a human face on the American ambassador. He's, he's, he's not just there uh, 
telling them to shape up on uh, on the rule of law, but he likes to let his hair down and uh, and play uh, some old uh, Charlie Mingus tunes with with the Igor Butman big band. <laughs> Well, let's hope that there will be more of that uh, in the relationship. And I want to thank you very much. Uh, sincerely, Ambassador Alexander Birschbaum. It was really a pleasure. And um, as usual, I learned a lot and appreciate it very much. That was my pleasure. It's uh, jogging my memory. We'll have to do this again sometime. <laughs> Loved him. <you. laughs> thank you.